everyone. Welcome to part three of chapter five. Today, we're going to take what we've learned about the mole and molar mass and apply it to some new types of problems. First, we're going to learn how to calculate the percentage composition of compounds from both experimental and theoretical data. We'll also learn how to calculate the percentage composition of hydrates. The second half of our lecture will be on calculating the empirical and molecular formulas of compounds. This is really important for elemental analysis of unknown compounds, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But lots to cover today, so let's get going. So our first thing we're going to look at is calculating percent. And just generally, if we were thinking about the percent of a mixture, then we can think about using the part over the total. Like if I was to think about how many girls there were in our class, I could put the number of girls divided by the total people in the class, and that would give me the percentage of girls in the class, right? So we can do the same thing, but with compounds. We'll look at the total mass of one element divided by the mass of the compound times 100. So that's what we're going to look at here. Before we get to any chemistry, though, let's just talk about flowers, right? Just percentages in general. So let's say we were running a genetics experiment and there were 25 red flowers, 33 yellow flowers, and 22 white flowers. And I wanna know what is the percentage of red flowers? Well, like I said, the general formula for calculating percent is the part over the total. So we can get our total number of flowers by simply adding them up. 25 plus 33 plus 22. You'll notice this says 80 point. That's to make sure that that zero there is significant. I know it looks a little bit silly um, because we're used to seeing things as either 80 or like 80.0. Well, this would have one significant figure and this would have three. So this is how we show two significant figures for this number. Um, but back to calculating percents, if we were to calculate the percent of red flowers, then we would put the total number of red flowers on the top divided by the total number of flowers on the bottom and multiply by 100. And so this will give us 31% of red flowers. So again, just in general, we're always going to put what we're looking for on the top and the total on the bottom and then multiply by 100 to turn it into a percent. So in chemistry, the way that we do this is we typically use the mass percent. Okay, so let's say we have a sample of nickel oxide, and I told you that this sample of nickel oxide is 14 grams of nickel and 7.64 grams of oxygen. And I wanna know the percentage of both nickel and oxygen in the mixture. So this is kind of like two different problems. I wanna calculate the percentage of nickel, and I also want to calculate the percentage of oxygen. So we're going to use essentially the same formula. It's what we're looking for divided by the total. The difference here is that we're using the masses of these things because now we're in chemistry. So it'll be the mass of whatever we're looking for divided by the total mass times 100. So first, we need to figure out what is the total mass. So if we just add those together, we'll get the total mass of our sample of nickel oxide. To calculate the percentage of nickel, we'll put the mass of nickel on the top divided by this total that we found, and then we'll multiply that by 100 to get our percent. We can do the exact same thing for oxygen, except instead of putting nickel on the top, now we put oxygen on the top. But you'll notice both of these are being divided by the total mass, because the total mass doesn't change whether we're looking for nickel or for oxygen, right? Because that's the mass of our compound. So the only thing that's changing here is that number on the top. And then again, we'll multiply it by 100 and get, um, our percentage. So if you look at these, these should always add up to 100% or pretty darn close, right? Because in this one, we had a sample of nickel oxide. So the only things in there are nickel and oxygen. So if we add up our percentages of nickel and oxygen, we should get pretty darn close to 100, if not exactly that. If you get like 99.99 or maybe 100.01, then that's telling you that it is 100, there's just some rounding errors that happened along the way, and that's okay. But it should just be pretty close to 100, okay? So our total mass of, or our total of the mass percents should always equal about 
So again, the way that we do this for compounds is we will calculate the mass percent for each element in the compound. So when we're looking at the chemical formula, the molar mass is going to represent the total mass of the compound. That will be 100%. And we learned how to calculate the molar mass in a previous lecture. So make sure you're already good at doing that before you keep going with this one. Um, so it's important here to note that the percent composition is independent of sample size. What that means is it doesn't matter how much of your sample you have, you're always going to have the same percent by mass as long as it's that pure compound. So like water will always have the same percent hydrogen and the same percent oxygen, no matter if you have a small glass of water or a large ocean of water, right? That percentage doesn't change because it's always going to be the same ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. So the way that we can do this is we can know the compound's chemical formula and from that, we can get the mass percent and we're going to do that first. We can also determine the mass percent from experimental data, and we'll actually do this in a lab in this class, which is pretty cool. You can run an experiment to see the masses of our elements and use that to figure out our mass percent of our compound. Pretty cool. So let's go figuring out um, the mass percent composition from the compound's formula. So there are two steps to doing this. The first one, you need to be able to calculate the molar mass of your compound. And then you're gonna divide the total mass of each element by the molar mass and then multiply by 100, and that will give you the mass percent of each element. And I'm gonna go through an example, and I think it will make a lot more sense when I do. But the formula that we're going to use here is our element's mass, whichever element we're looking for, we're gonna put the mass of that element on the top, and then divided by the molar mass on the bottom, and again, multiplying by 100 to turn that into a percent. Uh, the important thing here is that it says the total element mass. So like if I'm looking for the mass percent of oxygen, I need to use the total mass of oxygen in that compound. Or if I'm looking for the mass percent of carbon, I need to use the total mass of carbon in that compound. So that's an important distinction here. Again, remember that if I went through and added up all of the percentages of all of the elements in that compound, it needs to equal 100%, okay? And so this is actually a really good way to check your answer. Um, if you get to the end and you've done the mass percents of all of the elements, if they don't add up to 100, then you've done something wrong and you need to go back and check it out. Um, so that's a nice check. So let's try this one. This says calculate the percentage composition of potassium sulfide. So the first thing we always need to do is calculate the molar mass. So when we're looking at this, we have two potassiums. So we'll do two times the mass of potassium and we have one sulfur, so we add the mass of sulfur. So two times the mass of potassium plus the mass of sulfur gives us 110.27 grams of potassium sulfide. And that's our molar mass. So when we calculate the percent composition of each element, we're, remember, we're going to put the total mass of that element on the top. So for potassium, you see in this formula, there are two potassiums. So on the top here, we need to do two times the mass of potassium. That's very important. Don't forget to multiply it by two to represent the fact that there are two potassiums in this compound. And then we'll divide by the molar mass that we found earlier and multiply by 100 to get our percent. We'll do the same thing with sulfur, but you're, you'll notice here that it's not being multiplied by anything. And that's because there's only one sulfur in this compound, so we don't need to multiply it by anything. We'll just divide it by the molar mass and multiply it by 100. And then, whoop, if we went through and added these up, right, if we add these up, that will give us exactly 100%. And so that's how we know that we've done the problem correctly because all of our mass percents add up to 100. All right. Your turn. I want you to calculate the percentage composition of oxygen in hydrogen peroxide, okay? For this problem, I don't need you to calculate the mass percent of hydrogen. I just am asking for the mass percent of oxygen. So you don't have to do both elements. However, if you wanna check your work, you can do the mass percent of hydrogen and the mass percent of oxygen and add them together to make sure you get 100%. So go ahead, pause here, try that out, and come back when you're ready to see the answer.
Alrighty, so like we were talking about before, our first step is always going to be to calculate the molar mass. When you do this, it'll be two times the mass of hydrogen because there's two hydrogens in our compound, and two times the mass of oxygen because there's two oxygens in our compound. Then we'll add those together and we get that our molar mass is 34.02 grams. All right, now we can go about finding the percentage of oxygen in this compound. So to do that, we are going to put our total mass of oxygen on the top. Look at your paper and make sure that you multiplied two times that molar mass of oxygen, two times 16, not just 16, because we need to take all of the oxygen that's in our compound. And then we'll divide it by the molar mass and multiply it by 100 to get our percent. Again, you could have done this exact same thing with hydrogen and then added them together to make sure it gets 100 to kind of double check your work. So this isn't just something that we do in chemistry, but this actually has uses out in the real world. So let's say you went to Lowe's or Home Depot, whichever one is your favorite, and you needed to buy some fertilizer for your plants. Well, you can actually go and buy specific types of fertilizer that have different percentages of nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important for helping plants to grow, and so it's important that your plants get enough nitrogen, which is why we add things like fertilizer to help them out. Um, so if you look, these are our different types of fertilizers that are kind of common um, around here, and they have very different percentages of nitrogen by mass. So if you needed a lot of nitrogen, you could add some ammonia, which is kind of uncommon. Usually we use ammonia as more of a cleaning agent. Um, but these other ones here have also different percentages by nitrogen. So you can pick, you know, the best fertilizer for your plants, depending on how much nitrogen you need, which is kind of cool. Um, if you go and you buy some fertilizer, it looks like this, right, with these numbers. And those are telling you the percentages of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which is cool. So you may not have known what those numbers meant before, but now the next time you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, um, check it out and see if you can find them and maybe tell your friends or family what it means. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and practice this for a little bit. Find your chapter five lecture worksheet and complete problems number 34 to 36 on the chapter five lecture worksheet. When you're done, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, so we were just learning how to calculate the percentage composition from the chemical formula. This is going to be called the theoretical percentage composition. We can also do this from experimental data. So if we do an experiment and collect some data, we can actually use that data to determine the percentage composition of the elements in our compound, which is pretty cool. Um, so our first step will be to calculate the mass of the compound formed. This is really easy. Usually you're just going to weigh your product at the end of your reaction and see what the mass is. And then usually you'll have col collected some data along the way that will tell you the masses of each element. So to find our percent composition, you're going to do the exact same thing we were doing before. We'll take the mass of that particular element, divide it by the total mass of the compound, and multiply by 100 to get our percent. So again, it's going to be what we're looking for divided by the total mass times 100. All right, here's an example problem. So this says when heated in air, 1.63 grams of zinc reacts with 0 0.40 grams of oxygen to give zinc oxide. Calculate the percent composition of the compound formed. Okay, so this looks a little bit different than the problems we were doing previously. Right before it said, here's the chemical formula, tell me the percent composition of each element. But this is different. I'm telling you, okay, this compound that we made is 1.63 grams of zinc and 0 0.40 grams of oxygen. Okay, those are the important bits. So we have the mass of each element, but we need to find the total mass, right? Because in order to calculate the percent composition, we need to do our mass of our element divided by the total mass. So the total mass is really easy. We're just gonna add them together, right? Because if we're making zinc oxide, then our zinc and our oxygen have been combined to give us our product. So we're gonna add together those two masses 
and that will give the mass of the compound formed. Then when we go through to calculate the percentage of each element, we're going to take the mass of that element and divide by this total here. So for example, if we were to calculate the percentage of zinc, we would put the mass of zinc on the top and the total mass of our compound on the bottom and then multiply by 100 to give us our percentage. We can do the exact same thing for oxygen, right? We put that mass of oxygen on the top divided by the total mass of our compound times 100 to give us our percentage. And again, if we add these up, you'll see that it comes out pretty darn close to 100. Not quite exactly because this has been rounded for significant figures, um, but pretty close and close enough to tell us that we've done the problem correctly. All right, I'm gonna have you do a practice problem. This practice problem is pretty much exactly the same as the one that we just did, except now we're forming aluminum chloride instead of zinc oxide. So go ahead, pause here, try this out, and come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, so like I said, we're trying to figure out the formula of aluminum chloride, okay? So we have our mass of aluminum and we have our mass of chlorine. So it's asking for what is the percent composition of chlorine in this compound? So the first thing we need to do is figure out the total mass of the compound. The way that we do this is we add together the masses of both of our elements. So we'll take our mass of aluminum plus our mass of chlorine, and that will give us our mass of our compound. To figure out the percent composition of chlorine, we'll take our total mass of chlorine and that will go on the top here, okay? And then on the bottom will be the total mass of our compound and we'll multiply by 100 to get our percentage. We can also calculate the percentage composition of hydrates. So we haven't talked about hydrates before, um, but hydrates are solids that contain water molecules as part of their crystalline structure. So this will be ionic compounds, okay? So like this one, calcium chloride. So we've already learned how to write the formulas of ionic compounds, and we've also learned how to recognize what ionic compounds are. Remember, ionic compounds are between a metal and a non-metal. So here, calcium chloride, this is an ionic compound. A lot of ionic compounds have the ability to absorb water over time, which is kind of interesting. If you've gone to the beach, um, or sometimes back east, this is really common, or places with high humidity, you may see that people put rice in their salt shakers. If you've never seen this before, uh, this is something that actually happens. People put rice in salt shakers. And the reason for this is that salt is an ionic compound and it can absorb water. And if the salt in your salt shaker absorbs water, then it's gonna turn into a rock hard solid and you're not gonna be able to shake it onto your food, which is kind of interesting, right? So if you put rice in there, that rice is going to absorb the water before your salt does. Kind of like putting your cell phone in rice, right? It'll help to absorb the water, okay? So same kind of thing, but for your salt. So like here, calcium chloride can absorb water into its crystalline structure. Okay, so ionic compounds kind of look like this. They're just regular repeating patterns of um, our ions, okay? And they can actually tuck water molecules into some of the spaces of these salt crystals, okay? Um, usually though, the way that we write our ionic compounds is we write them as anhydrous, which means we leave out the water even if it's got some on there um, because we're really looking at the metal and the non-metal because that's the part that's reacting. But if I was going to go buy some of these ionic compounds, they actually are usually sold as their hydrate. And it's written like this. So it'll say, okay, this is calcium chloride, but it has, for every calcium chloride, there are two water molecules that are trapped in the crystalline structure, which is kind of cool. So the way that we would read this is we would read this as calcium chloride dihydrate. Okay, we're just going to use a prefix to tell us how many hydrate molecules there are, how many water molecules there are. So again, this is calcium chloride dihydrate, okay? Um, but that number in the front here, I know that looks a little bit silly, that's telling you how many water molecules per calcium chloride are trapped in the crystal structure. 
okay? And like I said, we would name this as calcium chloride dihydrate, or like this one here, do you see that there are six waters? So we name that hexahydrate. These prefixes are the same as the prefixes that we learned when we learned about covalent bonding. So if you already know those prefixes, it's really easy to name these hydrates, right? You're just going to name the ionic compound the way that we've learned how to name them, right? So like this is iron three chloride, calcium chloride, and then you're gonna use a prefix in front of the word hydrate to tell how many hydrate molecules there are. You're not going to be expected to predict these numbers of hydrates. The only thing I will ask you to do with the hydrates is to either, you know, look at the formula and write the name or look at the name and write the formula. So hydrates, when we heat a hydrate, we can often decompose them because they will lose water when you heat them. So if you'll recall, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So if we heat up our salt above 100 degrees Celsius, we can actually drive off these water molecules and do what's called dehydrating them, right? So we take our copper sulfate pentahydrate and we heat it to a temperature above 100 degrees Celsius. And when we do that, the water molecules leave as a gas and we're left with just copper sulfate solid which is kind of cool. So what's being shown in this picture here is that copper sulfate, when it has water molecules trapped in it, right? When it is this um, pentahydrate here, it turns blue, which is cool. And that's actually um, a very common color for copper. But if we were to dehydrate our copper, right? We heat it up really, really hot and dehydrate our copper sulfate, we can actually change the color because there's not water molecules trapped anymore, it changes the crystal structure, which changes the color, which is cool. So I can tell just by looking at it whether or not it has water molecules trapped in it. Kind of cool. All right, so just like we learned how to calculate the percentage composition of each element in a compound, we can do the same thing by calculating how much water is in a hydrate, okay? So this, the formula here, this magnesium sulfate, with the seven waters, heptahydrate, that is the formula of Epsom salts. So we can actually calculate how much of our mass is water in these Epsom salts. So the first thing we're gonna do is just like we've done before, we're going to calculate the molar mass of the compound, but we've never calculated the molar mass of a hydrate before. So I'll show you how to do this. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to calculate the mass of magnesium sulfate, just like we normally do. So we would do one magnesium plus one sulfate plus four oxygens, just like normal, nothing that changes, okay? So if we added up magnesium plus sulfur plus four oxygens, we would get 120.38. And that's how we would normally calculate the molar mass of magnesium sulfate. However, this is a heptahydrate. So we need to add in the mass of all of those water molecules. So there are seven water molecules there so I did seven times the mass of water. Um, if you don't know the mass of water off the top of your head, it's 18.02. And honestly, we are gonna calculate the mass of water a lot in this class. So that's one of those that you'll probably accidentally memorize the molar mass of water. But if you don't, you could do you know two times the mass of hydrogen plus oxygen, and that will give you the molar mass of water, which is 18.02, and then you can multiply that by seven. So we're doing the exact same thing we, that we've normally done, except we're adding in the mass of all of those water molecules that are attached to our ionic compound. So once we've got our molar mass, now we can calculate the percentage of water in the compound. And we do this just the same as we've done for all of the elements. We're going to take our total mass of water, so this number here, the 17 times 18.02, that's our total mass of water, and then we're gonna divide it by the total mass of our compound, just like we've done before. The only difference here is that instead of putting the total mass of an element on the top, now we're putting the total mass of water, okay? Nothing else changes though. Everything else is the same and we'll get our percentage. So what's interesting is if we have these Epsom salts, over 50%, right? Over half of this mass is just water. Kinda crazy. All right, your turn. I want you to try this out. Calculate the percentage of water in co copper sulfate 
pentahydrate, okay? Um, again, make sure you know how to calculate the molar mass of this. We're gonna calculate the molar mass of that copper two sulfate, just the way we've done it before, and then we're gonna add the mass of five water molecules. That'll give us the molar mass of this compound, and then we can calculate the percentage of water in this compound. So go ahead, pause here and try that out, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, so the first thing we're going to do is calculate the percentage of water in our copper two sulfate pentahydrate. So here we go. Here's the molar mass of copper sulfate. So it's copper plus sulfur plus four oxygens. That'll give us 159.62. And then we'll add in the mass of five water molecules. So again, five times 18.02. So if we add all that up, here's our molar mass of our compound. To calculate the percent of water, we're going to do the mass of water divided by the molar mass. So this is our mass of water here. So that will go on the top and then our molar mass will go on the bottom and we'll multiply by 100 to get our percent. Alrighty, we've got some more practice problems. Go ahead and pause here and complete problems number 37 to 40 on the chapter five lecture worksheet. When you're done, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, our last big topic of chapter five is empirical and molecular formulas. Okay, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on these calculations because they're a little bit tricky. So our empirical formulas are our smallest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. Whereas our molecular formula is the actual formula in a compound. That'll tell us all of the number of atoms in one formula unit of our compound. Okay, so the difference is here, this is the smallest whole number ratio, and this is the actual chemical formula of our compound. So here's an example. Let's take, for example, acetylene. Acetylene is C2H2, and benzene is C6H6. We're not going to learn how to name these types of compounds in this class. These are organic molecules and follow different naming systems. Um, so if you're not understanding where these names are coming from, don't worry about that. I'm just going to tell you that's what these are called. So if you'll notice, though, both of them will have the same empirical formula. If we look at the lowest whole number ratio of carbon to hydrogen, do you see that the, for every two carbons, there's two hydrogens? So really, that's a one to one ratio of carbon to hydrogen. It's the same thing in benzene. For every six carbons, there's six hydrogens. So for that, there's also a one-to-one -one ratio. So these compounds have the same empirical formula. Their empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio. So this is saying for every one carbon, there's one hydrogen. Okay, so that's the empirical formula. What we're seeing up here, that is the molecular formula. That's the actual number of each element in the compound. So in acetylene, there are two carbons and there are two hydrogens. And in benzene, there are six carbons and there are six hydrogens. So those are the molecular formulas. But our empirical formulas are our lowest whole number ratio. And they're showing that the carbon to hydrogen ratio is a one to one. Okay, so each of these molecular formulas is just a multiple of the empirical formula. So if I take my empirical formula and multiply it by two, then I'll get acetylene. If I take my empirical formula and multiply it by six, then I get benzene. Okay, so we're taking some whole number and we're multiplying it by our empirical formula to get the molecular formula. Okay, so here's our kind of sum up. The molecular formula is a whole number multiple of the empirical formula. So this is another way of showing it. So our empirical formula for both of these was CH. And again, that's showing that it's a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon to hydrogen. But our molecular formula for each of them is different, right? Because that's telling us the total number of each element in these compounds. And these are the structures of the two compounds, um, but don't worry about that for now. Right now, I just want you to focus on the difference between empirical and molecular formulas. So because they have the same 
empirical formulas, they actually have the same percentage composition. So both of these, both acetylene and benzene, are 92.3% carbon and 7.7% hydrogen. So things that have the same empirical formula will have the same percentage composition. However, their molar masses are different, right? The molar mass of acetylene is 26.04, and the molar mass of benzene is 78.16, because, right, acetylene only has two carbons and two hydrogens, and benzene has six carbons and six hydrogens. So it makes sense that benzene has the larger molar mass, okay? So each of these compounds, even though they have the same empirical formula, they have really different properties because the number of carbons are different, the number of hydrogens is actually different, the molar masses are different. So these are totally different compounds. The only thing they share in common is that they have the same empirical formula and therefore the same percentage composition. All right, we're going to go through how to calculate the empirical formula of a compound, okay? This is really useful because sometimes we have compounds that we come across in lab and we don't know what they are. This is really common if you're working in maybe an analytical chemistry lab of some kind and you're trying to figure out what you have. This is also really useful in forensics. If you come across a sample of some white powder at a crime scene, you need to be able to figure out what that white powder is, right? Um, so we do elemental analysis to try and figure out what these mystery things are. And so this calculating the empirical formula is trying to figure out what these mystery substances are. We can put them in what's called a mass spectrometer and it will give us percentages of different elements. So we can figure out what percent of carbon it is, what percent of hydrogen it is, maybe oxygen, right? And we can figure that out and that will help us determine the empirical formula. So what I'm going through right now is figuring out how to use that data, that percent of carbon, percent of hydrogen, percent of oxygen data to come up with a chemical formula for this substance. And that will be its empirical formula. So to calculate this empirical formula, you need to know a couple things. The first thing you need to know is which elements are present in the compound. I will always tell you this. I'll say, okay, this compound is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or maybe carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine, right? I will tell you what those are. Um, if this was an actual lab, then we would use some kind of elemental analysis and the computer would tell us what the elements are in there. The next thing you need to know is the ratio, um, and usually this is the mass percent or just the mass itself of the combined elements. So it'll say um, your sample is 16% carbon and 32% oxygen or whatever it is. Or it will tell you out of the total sample, you have three grams of carbon and five grams of oxygen or whatever the case may be. You're also going to need the atomic masses of each element from the periodic table. This will allow us to do some grams to moles conversion, which is going to be really useful in this process. So here is our strategy. I'm going to go through this right now and kind of talk through each step, but I'll be kind of honest, it won't make a lot of sense until we actually go through an example problem. So I would recommend printing out this slide and keeping it handy when you're solving these empirical formula problems, because this will give you kind of a roadmap for how to do it. The nice thing about empirical formula problems is if you always do it the exact same way, you'll always get the right answer, which is pretty cool. Um, and a lot of people like that, it's very predictable. So again, I'm gonna talk through this and kind of explain it, but I think the example problem will really clarify things. So the first thing we're going to do is express the mass of each element in grams, okay? Sometimes you'll actually be given grams in the problem. And I'll say it's this many grams of this and this many grams of that, right? But if I don't give you grams, then the other way it can show up is I will give you percentages. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use those percentages as grams. We're going to assume we have 100 grams of our compound and therefore our percentages can be used directly as grams. So you're either going to be given the grams or percents that we'll use as grams. Our next step is to convert the grams of each element to moles using the molar mass, okay? So we're gonna make a bunch of little train tracks and we're going to take the grams of our element 
divide it by the molar mass, and that will give us moles. Um, and this is typically not whole numbers. It says it may or may not be, but honestly, it's usually not a whole number, okay? The next thing we're gonna do is now, now that we have moles of each of the elements, we are going to figure out which number of moles is the smallest. And we're going to take that number and use it to divide all of the other numbers by that number. Okay, so like I said, this is the step that will make more sense once you see it. Okay, so we're going to take the smallest number of moles and divide up all of our other moles by that number. And then usually the, that, those numbers will be whole numbers and they will end up being the subscripts in our chemical formula. However, sometimes in this step, you'll end up with uh, recognizable decimals, like things like 0.25 or 0.33 or 0.5, and we will recognize those decimals as fractions, and we'll actually need to multiply those numbers by a number to get them out of decimals. So that may not make a lot of sense right now, but it will once I go through a problem, I promise. Oh, sorry. If you want to, go ahead and screenshot this slide or take a picture of it for reference once we're going through this process. Alrighty, our first example problem. This says calculate the empirical formula for a compound that contains 11.19% hydrogen and 88.79% oxygen. All right, so here we're going to assume that our total compound just has hydrogen and oxygen because that's all it's talked about. And if you look at those percentages, right, they're going to add up to essentially 100%. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is determine the gram amounts of each element. If you'll recall before, I told you when you have percents like this, you're going to use them as the grams. So if I have 11.19% of hydrogen, I'm just going to use that as grams of hydrogen. And if I have 88.79% of oxygen, I'm going to use that as grams of oxygen. That's it. Don't make it any harder than that. You're just going to take, turn that percent sign into a gram because we're just going to assume that we had 100 grams of our compound. Our next step is to convert grams to moles using the molar masses. So we're going to do a train track for each element and we're going to turn each one from grams into moles. So here's the one for hydrogen. We're going to use our mass of hydrogen, right? Divided by the molar mass, uh, and that will be one mole, okay? So we have our molar mass on the top because remember, grams has to cancel grams down into the left, or sorry, down into the right. Our grams cancels grams down into the right like our units always do, and we'll put one mole on the top. Remember, when we're doing these conversions, the masses on the periodic table are always equal to one mole of our element. So when things are equal, remember, they get stacked in our train tracks. So that's how we knew that grams goes on the bottom here because our grams has to cancel grams. So that's why we put the other half of that equality on the top. Okay, so that will get us our moles of hydrogen. We will then do the exact same thing up for oxygen. So we'll take our mass of oxygen divided by the molar mass of oxygen, and then one mole will go on the top, and that will give us our moles of oxygen. You'll notice here that these elements, right, hydrogen and oxygen, these are diatomic elements. So usually we'll use these as H2 and O2. And so a common mistake here is that people will use their diatomic mass instead of just the mass from the periodic table. So I'm telling you now that's not an error. You really do just use the mass from the periodic table even for our diatomic elements, because we're just trying to figure out how many individual moles of singular hydrogen and singular oxygen there are in our compound. All right, once we convert grams to moles for each element, we are going to look and see which one is the smallest. Okay, so we have 11.10 versus 5.549. So hopefully it's pretty obvious. This number of moles is smaller, right? 5.549 is smaller then 11.10. So what we're gonna do is we are going to take 5.549 and we're gonna divide both of these by that number. So we're gonna divide this one by 5.549 and we're gonna divide this one by 5.549. And we're gonna see what we get from that. So again, you're gonna figure out which number of moles is the smallest and you're gonna divide all of the other numbers of moles 
by that number. So when we do that, when we divide both of these by 5.549, we are going to get whole numbers. So we're going to get two hydrogens and one oxygen. So that means this is H2O, right? Two hydrogens and one oxygen. So these numbers that we get here become the subscripts in our chemical formula. Okay, so two hydrogens, one oxygen gives us H2O. Sometimes people will ask me, how do we know the order of the elements in this compound here? In this class, I'm not going to worry about what order you put the elements in. Usually it's going to go carbon and then hydrogen and then oxygen and then any other elements you have. And so you're welcome to put them in that order if you like. But if you put them out of order, you won't be marked incorrectly. I'm more worried about here, you getting the correct formula uh, with the correct subscripts. All right, let's try another example problem because this is a little bit tricky. So again, we are going to calculate the empirical formula and we have two masses there. You'll notice this time we don't have percents. This time we just have masses. So it actually makes it even easier. We don't need to do anything with those masses. We're just gonna keep them as they are. Our first step is to figure out how many grams of each element we are. So we're just like, all right, we got grams of iron. We got grams of sulfur. That's it. Our next step is to take the grams of each element and make a train track for each element to convert grams into moles. So here's our train track for iron. Remember, the mass on the periodic table is equal to one mole. That's why they get stacked there. And remember, grams has to cancel grams. So that's how we know the gram portion of that equality goes on the bottom. So once we get that, that will give us our moles of iron. We'll do the exact same thing for sulfur, right? Remember, molar mass goes on the bottom here. Um, because grams has to cancel grams, and that will get us our number of moles of sulfur. So just like last time, we need to figure out which one of these is smaller. So in comparing them, do you see that the iron is smaller, right? 0 0.03998 is smaller than 0 0.06006. So we're going to divide both of these numbers by 0 0.03998. All right, so once we do that, once we divide both of them by the smallest number, we get this, okay? So you'll notice the one for iron, that came out as a whole number, which is cool, but you'll notice that this one for sulfur didn't, okay? If they're really, really close to a whole number, like if it comes out to 1.999 or something like that, then you can round it to the nearest whole number but it's gotta be really, really close. 1.5 is not close to a whole number, right? That's smack in the middle of one and two. So we can't round that, but hopefully you'll notice 0.5 is the fraction one half, okay? And I know how much everybody loves fractions, um, but I want you to recognize that 0.5 is the same as one half. So here, this is really like one and a half or three halves. So we need to get rid of that fraction. So since this fraction, this 0.5 is 1 half, we are going to multiply it by the number on the bottom to get rid of that fraction. So since this is 1 half, we're gonna multiply both of these by two to get rid of that fraction. So I wanna be really, really clear. One of the places people mess up is they forget they need to multiply everything by that number. So even though our iron came out as a whole number, we still need to multiply it by two because we're going to multiply everything by two. So we'll multiply iron by two and that will give us two irons. We'll multiply the sulfur by two and that will give us three sulfurs. So our chemical formula is Fe2S3. Remember, these numbers here become our subscripts. So just to review, the reason that we had to do this, right, this multiplying step is because these numbers did not come out to whole numbers. Well, one of them did, but one of them didn't. And if they don't all come out to whole numbers, then we're going to multiply it by something to get rid of that fraction, okay? I would keep this as a reference somewhere, especially if fractions are not your jam. So if it comes out, one of them comes out to 0.25, we'll recognize that as 1 fourth, and we would multiply all of them by four, right? You're gonna multiply by the number on the bottom. If you get you know, that 0.33, you'd multiply all of them by three. Here we multiplied all of them by two. 
we'd multiply all of them by three and all of them by four, right? You're gonna multiply them by that number on the bottom to get rid of the fraction. All right, we've got a practice problem. Go ahead and pause here and try this out. You'll notice this problem is a little bit different because now you have three elements instead of two. But the way that we do this problem is exactly the same. Figure out the masses, convert all of the masses into moles, divide by the smallest number of moles, and see where that gets you. So go ahead, pause here and try this out. Come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, so the first step is to turn all of our percents into grams. It's really easy. All we're gonna do is we're going to change the sign. So instead of having um, percentages, we now have grams. That's it, the end. Our next step will be to make a train track for each element. Okay, so we're gonna have three train tracks, one for potassium, one for carbon, and one for oxygen. And for each one of these, we are going to divide by the molar mass. Okay, so for potassium, we divided by the molar mass of potassium. For carbon, we divided by the molar mass of carbon. And for oxygen, we divided by the molar mass of oxygen. So you should get these numbers, okay? When we're looking at these numbers, again, our next step is to figure out which one is the smallest. Hopefully we all see here that our moles of carbon is the smallest. So we're gonna divide all of these by 0 0.723. Okay, so once we do that, once we divide all of these by 0 0.723, we see what we get. We'll get two potassiums, one carbon, and three oxygens. These all came out to whole numbers. So we don't need to multiply anything to get rid of a fraction because there's no fractions. So that's always really nice. So once these all come out as whole numbers, we can take those numbers and use them as our subscripts in our chemical formula. So this comes out to two potassiums, one carbon, and three oxygens. Alrighty, go ahead and pause here and complete problems number 41 to 45 on the chapter five lecture worksheet. Once you're done, come back. We do have a bit more to go in today's lecture. Alrighty. So if you'll recall from us talking earlier, we were learning about empirical formulas, but empirical formulas are just telling us the ratio of the combination of the atoms in a molecules, not actually how many of each element is in there. Like for acetylene and benzene, they would have the formulas of CH. And that's just telling us for every one carbon, there's one hydrogen, but it doesn't tell us anything about the molecular formula. The molecular formula is the actual formula, right? Um, so acetylene has two carbons and two hydrogens, whereas benzene has six carbons and six hydrogens. Um, and so there's quite a few cases where, you know, multiple compounds have the same empirical formula, just like acetylene and benzene. So you can imagine if we were doing an elemental analysis and we put acetylene into our spectrometer and it came out with our empirical formula of CH, and we did the same thing with benzene, it came out with our empirical formula CH. Well, how do we tell them apart, right? They have the same empirical formula. So how do we know which one it is? Uh, the answer to that is you need to know the, mo the molar mass of your compound, your actual compound, right, of your molecular formula. Like you need to know this molar mass in order to figure out the molecular formula for your compound, okay? so. Let's go about how to do that. So if we know our molar mass, then we can find the molecular formula from the empirical formula. So you're always going to calculate the empirical formula first, and then if we have the molar mass, we can use that afterwards to calculate the molecular formula. So this is essentially adding on more steps to this process. Okay, so our molecular formula, I'm gonna abbreviate by capital M, capital F and I'm gonna abbreviate empirical formula by EF. Okay, so in order to figure out this molecular formula, we need to figure out this value of N. Remember, 
we would take our empirical formula and multiply it by some number to get our molecular formula. So if we go back a slide, like if we took our empirical formula here and we made multiply this by two, then that would get our molecular formula. And if we took our empirical formula here and instead multiply it by six, that would get our molecular formula for benzene, right? So we always are going to multiply everything in that compound by a number to get our molecular formula. But we just need to figure out, okay, well, are we multiplying it by two or are we multiplying it by six? Because that makes a difference in which compound we're identifying. So the way that we're going to figure out that number, is it a two, is it a six, is it a what, is we are going to divide the molar mass of our molecular formula by the molar mass of our empirical formula, okay? Um, and if you can't remember which one goes on the top, the molecular formula is always going to be larger in value. So this will essentially be the big molar mass divided by the small molar mass, if you forget which one's which. But the molecular formula of I'm sorry, the molar mass of the molecular formula will go on the top. The molar, molar mass of the empirical formula will go on the bottom. That will give you a whole number. It will never, ever, ever give you any kind of decimal ever. If it gives you a decimal number, you've done something wrong. And you probably calculated your empirical formula wrong somewhere, and you'll need to go check it out. So just as a heads up there. So as soon as we figure out what N is, then we can plug it in right here and we can get our molecular formula. So let's go through an example of this. It says a compound with the empirical formula NH2. So that means we've already gone through that entire process we were doing before and we have figured out our formula is NH2. And it says it was found to have a molar mass of 32.05. What is the molecular formula? So it says, okay, this is the empirical formula, which is showing us the lowest whole number ratio. The actual formula, right, the molecular formula, has this molar mass. So this is for the molecular formula. And I want to know, what is the molecular formula? All right, so again, the way that we do this is we're going to put the molar mass of the molecular formula on the top and the molar mass of the empirical formula on the bottom. So we already have the molar mass of our molecular formula. That goes here. But we need to figure out the molar mass of our empirical formula. We know how to do that, right? To do that, we're going to add up the masses of, you know, one nitrogen plus two hydrogen. So if we do that, here's our nitrogen plus two hydrogens, and that will give us the molar mass of our empirical formula. So again, molecular on the top, empirical on the bottom, okay? And then that will tell us, okay, the ratio is two. So remember, if the ratio is two, that's telling us that we have NH2 with the two on the outside. This two is going to end up getting distributed to everything inside, okay? Just like in math, when we distribute things, we're going to distribute that two to everything inside the parentheses. So it's going to end up being two nitrogens and two times two will give us four hydrogens. All right, your turn for a practice problem. This says a compound with the empirical formula of NO2 was found to have a molar mass of 92 grams. What is the molecular formula? Go ahead and pause here and try to do this problem just like we did the previous example problem. When you're done, come back and I'll give you the answer. Alrighty, so like we talked about before, our molar mass of our molecular formula will go on the top. This is typically the one that's given in the problem. So that will be here. And then the molar mass of our empirical formula will go on the bottom. So it'll be the mass of nitrogen plus two oxygens. If we divide that up, we get two. So that means our molecular formula is two times our empirical formula. So two will get multiplied in to the nitrogen, so that's N2, and it will also get multiplied in to the oxygen, O4. So this is dinitrogen tetroxide. Alrighty, let's try and put this all together. So here is a big long example problem. This says polypropyl, or sorry, propylene 
contains 14.3% of hydrogen and 85.7% of carbon, and it has a molar mass of 42.08. What is its molecular formula? So you'll know to do both pieces of this type of problem if it's asking for the molecular formula. If it asks for the empirical formula, then you'll just solve for the empirical formula like we've done a couple times. But if it asks for the molecular formula, then we're going to need to find the empirical formula, find that ratio, and then multiply our empirical formula by the ratio to get the molecular formula. So let's see what this looks like. Like I said, our first step is to figure out the empirical formula. So we'll take each of these percents and we'll use them as our masses. Okay, so if we have 14.3% of hydrogen, that means we'll have 14.3 grams, uh, same for carbon. So once we figure out our grams of each element, we're gonna turn our grams into moles using the molar mass. So just like we've done before. So there it is for carbon and for hydrogen. So once we've figured out how many moles of each thing we have, we are gonna figure out which of those is the smaller number and divide both of them by that number. So it looks like carbon has the smaller number of moles. So I'm gonna divide both of these by 7.14. Okay. Once I divide both of them by 7.14, we'll get these numbers. You'll notice that hydrogen came out to 1.99. That is pretty close to two. So that's one of them that we can actually round. So we'll say, okay, this formula has two hydrogens and one carbon. Therefore, our empirical formula is CH2. So nothing is different about what we've done right there, right? We used our masses. We turned our masses into moles. We divided by the smallest number of moles to get our subscripts for our empirical formula. Now though, the new part is we are going to use our empirical formula to figure out the molecular formula. Okay, so from the previous problem, or the, from the problem itself, it told us the molar mass of the actual compound was 42.08. So that mass goes on the top. That's the mass of the molecular formula. And then we put the mass of the empirical formula down here on the bottom. So that'll be the mass of carbon plus the mass of two hydrogens. Once we calculate that, my apologies, I wrote over it, but that's a three. Okay, so this tells us that our ratio is three, which means we need to multiply everything in our empirical formula by three. So that will give us three carbons and six hydrogens. So we get three C3H6 as our molecular formula. So in this problem, we found the empirical formula and then we used our ratio to figure out the molecular formula. Alrighty, it's your turn. Go ahead and pause here and try this problem out. It's the same essentially as what I just did in the example problem. So if you're not sure how to do it still, go ahead and rewind and try this one again. So you've got percentages of two elements and the molar mass of our molecular formula. So go ahead and pause here and try and figure out your molecular formula and come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, let's go through this. So in this problem, we're given percentages, okay? So we need to use our percentages as grams in order to find the empirical formula, and then we'll use that ratio to find the molecular formula. So first step, use our percentages just as grams. So if we have 80% of carbon, that means we have 80 grams of carbon, and 20% of hydrogen becomes 20 grams of hydrogen. Next, we'll make a train track for each of those elements to turn grams into moles by dividing by the molar mass. So our 80 grams of carbon, we'll divide by our molar mass and get our number of moles. Same thing with our 20 grams of hydrogen. Divide by the molar mass and get our number of moles. Next, we'll see which one is smaller. So here, it looks like carbon is smaller. So we're gonna divide both of these by the number of moles of carbon. Once we've done that, we get 2.97 hydrogen, which is essentially three. Again, that's pretty close to three, so we're gonna go ahead and round that. We get exactly one carbon, so we've got 
one carbon there. So that tells us that our empirical formula is CH3. Now we need to calculate the molecular formula. So remember, the way that we do that is we use the mass of our molecular formula and the mass of our empirical formula to find the ratio. So the mass of our molecular formula will go on the top. That was given in the problem on the previous slide. And then the mass of our empirical formula will go on the bottom. So the mass of one carbon plus three hydrogens. If we divide those up, we get that our ratio is two. So we're gonna multiply all of the elements in our empirical formula by two to get our molecular formula. So we'll get C2H6. Alrighty, we have a few more problems on our chapter five lecture worksheet, problem number 46 through 50. And that actually concludes our lecture for today. We covered a lot of ground today. We learned how to use um, our chemical formula to figure out the mass percent of each element in a compound using theoretical data. We also did the same thing for experimental data, right? We learned how to use data from an experiment to determine the mass percent of each element in a compound. And we also learned how to do this for hydrates, which is really cool. And we learned what hydrates are and how to name them and write the chemical formula for them. We wrapped up today's lecture by learning how to calculate the empirical and molecular formulas. Although this is kind of a long process, like I told you before, if you always follow the same series of steps, they will always lead you to the right answer. And a lot of people find comfort in that, so that's always nice. Just make sure to get a lot of practice with those types of problems so you're familiar with the order of those steps. As always, make sure to do all of these problems on the lecture worksheet and check your answers against the key that's posted on Canvas. If you ever have any questions about how to do the problem or any of the example problems that we've done in these slides, please feel free to reach out and ask me questions. Remember, I teach chemistry because I like talking about chemistry. So you're not bothering me if you have a question. I genuinely want to, at, to answer it and help you be successful in the course. So feel free to always reach out if you have any questions. Otherwise, make sure to keep working hard and doing these practice problems so you get really, really good, especially at the math in this class, because I know that can trip people up. If you have any questions, send them my way. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.